Milton Friedman um, famously said that there was no such thing as a free lunch. Uh, but where I come from, <coughs> we call a good pint of beer lunch. And uh, so I'm really glad that uh, to see all, all you libertarians here to see me prove Milton Friedman wrong, because I have a big friend in spirit. <laughs> I have not been kind to libertarians in the past. Um, in some of my classes, I've suggested that libertarianism was the product of poor toilet training. <laughs> so tonight I come uh, with uh, an olive leaf, an olive branch, uh, and uh, I think um, I want to challenge us all to find common ground. Uh, so let me begin by stating, uh, and if you haven't figured it out, I'm the welfare state guy, right? That's the free <laughs> uh, they, they give him a second bill, so. Uh, you asked to go first. I know. <laughs> Um, I, I have been supportive and am supportive of a number of libertarian positions. Um, I'm in favor. I'm, I'm with you all on slashing the military budget and not having to be the rule of police. Um, I'm all over unbridled, rampant drug use, <laughs> <laughs> violent rap lyrics, sex with animals, whatever else you all are into. I'm, I'm good with that. It's just your heartless economic views that I have a real problem with, um, and your distrust for democracy, and maybe we can talk about that later. But I want to focus tonight um, on these e economic views. But, but first, I think we need to put things in a general framework. Um, to begin with, for the sake of argument, let me say that, let's say that I have the same understanding of freedom that you all do, in philosophic terms, we say that I'm a proponent of negative freedom, not positive freedom, freedom from other people, not freedom to do things. Um, and we'll say that I prioritize freedom in the same way you, uh, you all do. I would say freedom, let's say for tonight I say freedom is the highest virtue above things like justice and equality. So the question before us then is how do we maximize that freedom? How do we bring it about? And I want to say from the outset that this is largely an empirical question. This is a question about how the world is, not about how the world ought to be. And as such, the true libertarian, I think, should be open to any idea that proves itself fruitful to maximizing freedom. Uh, and with that in mind, uh, when we turn to matters of the economy, the question I think we need to ask is, what type of economy will bring about freedom best? And again, that's an empirical question. It's not a philosophical question. It's an empirical question. And let's be clear on what an implausible answer to that would be, an implausible answer. An implausible answer to the question of what type of economy brings about freedom best would be less government, more freedom. Now, I say it's implausible because we can never just pronounce that to be the case as a general claim. There are certainly instances where that will be true. I think the government staying out of your bedroom, staying out of your churches, letting people drink and smoke pot, that's true. Less government there would promote freedom, I think. And I would agree with you. But there are going to be a lot of instances where a bit of government is going to help. Um, let me give you some examples. Government is kind of handy in providing courts. It's, it's handy in creating and backing a monetary system. It's handy in the establishment, establishment and protection of property. You, know, you can't record uh, uh, deeds and copyrights without government. It's handy for law enforcement. Of, of property disputes, of wills. Uh, it's handy in handling property crimes, protecting interstate commerce. It's handy for providing a fire department. And I know some of you don't think there should be a public fire department, which um, I, I ran across a Onion headline, you know, the Onion, of great parody magazine, the Onion headline that said, Libertarian reluctantly calls fire department. <laughs> and then the article read, uh, after attempting to contain a living, living room blaze started by a cigarette, Libertarian Trent Jacobs reluctantly called the Cheyenne Fire Department. Quote, although the community would do better to rely on an efficient free market firefighting force, the fact is that expensive, unnecessary public fire departments do exist. 
Also, my house was burning down. <laughs> so, um, you know, I think that these things actually, these government interventions, if you want to call them, they add to your freedom. And if it concerns freedom, then let's, let's be for them. Now, mind you, one could ask of anyone who wants a public police force or a public fire department or a court system, um, why do you need to be coddled? Uh, why not protect your own possessions, right? So there could be an uber-libertarian fighting anyone that wants any sort of government to provide anything. Um, the, somebody could say, if you want a police force to protect your property, then you're just enabling people not to do things that free people do. That's a ridiculous stand in my mind. So if you're on board as libertarians with some minimal idea of government to protect your property, bear in mind that's already one step removed from a sort of purist libertarian position. Let me see if I can take you another couple of steps. <laughs> Um, some measure of restraint, I think, some law, some public coercion, is the bottom line, is going to be uh, important if you're going to maximize freedom. So again, we're left with an empirical question. What's the right amount? To repeat, the aim here is freedom, not less government. One is the goal, the other is a means. And let me repeat, it's a means. It may not be the only one, and there may be instances where it is not the only one. What strikes me as an odd answer is odd when I hear the answer from libertarianism to the question, you know, how do you promote freedom? It's always less government. But that can't always be the right answer. It's almost as if liberty has supplanted has been supplanted by the goal of less government. Libertarianism got to mean liberty, not less government. Where less government promotes liberty, great, but where it doesn't. Like if, if less government means no police force to protect your property, then maybe that's not a good idea. It doesn't make sense to say less government all the time is an intellectual matter. If everything you read tells you that the answer is less government, then I would suggest you read something else. Just on occasion. Um, I keep reading the, the pablum that guys like this spew out, but, but, um, but read something else too. I think it's ideology if the answer is always the same. So that's my general viewpoint, that we need to ask this as an empirical question. It's a policy discussion. And as such, I think you lose credibility if you always have the same policy. Less government, less government, less government. It shows that you're not being thoughtful about the intricacies of every policy matter. OK, so that's the general framework that I have in mind. Now let, let me get to some good policies. And so let me give you some examples where I think government is helpful beyond the ones I already gave you. And I'll give you some examples where I think we need less government. This coming from the welfare state, socialist, bleeding heart, liberal, baby seal, saver, whatever you want to call it. And let me begin with uh, some general ideas and then, uh, and then focus on welfare. First of all, I think environmental regulations are a good idea. And I think that they're a good idea for good libertarian reasons. They make the market function. They're, environmental problems are, are a result of what we call market failures. Costs are not being internalized. And government regulation is there to actually do that. I think that regulations that protect worker safety and labor rights are a good idea for freedom. The explosion in West Texas will find, I think, will largely have been caused by the lack of enforcement of regulations on the books. Let's have enforcement to have minimum safety standards in the places we work. And that's the role of government. This makes the market function more efficiently, by the way. This increases freedom. I'm all for consumer protection laws and, and regulations um, on, on things that are sold. Uh, even if we say consumers are responsible for making choices, I think we need to ensure that there's enough information out there for them to make those choices. So food labeling, inspecting the airplanes that we fly on. I know that you all think that private consortiums can do that, the food producers and the airlines can regulate themselves, but I have never seen any convincing empirical evidence to substantiate that claim. I think regulations on banks are good, and I think they were, have been, they were good for you know, the, the post-war period, right up until the 1980s when we deregulated the banks, and bang, we got the SNL crisis. Some of you are old enough to remember that. It cost the money, uh, cost the government a lot. And then we deregulated the banking industry again in the late 90s under the Clinton administration. And what did we get later? The financial uh, meltdown of 2008. I'm in favor, by the way, of overhauling the tax code uh, so that we don't just reward wealth, but we reward job creation. So there are a couple things there I think governments can do well if, done, if we pick the right program. 
You want some examples of foolish program? There are a lot of them. I think farm subsidies are foolish. Um, I think there are some crazy energy policies out there that encourage uh, driving to a greater extent. I think we should let gas cost what it really costs, which would be a lot more than it does now. Um, I think uh, educational policies in the last two administrations have been really poor. I think no child left behind under the Bush administration and, and race to the top under the Obama administration have been abominations from an yeah, ed education point of view. So I'm as critical as the next guy. But let's be clear, um, there, these policies I'm talking about are idiotic because, not because they distort a free market, but because they encourage idiotic production for, uh, and consumption. So my response is to change these policies, get better policies. In some cases, eliminate them, but do it thoughtfully. And um, let's do things in a sort of thoughtful manner on a case-by-case -case basis. And by all means, let's work hard to ensure that at the end of the day, our policies leave individuals with decisions to, with the decisions about their own lives. But let's not kid ourselves that you could actually remove government influence from that equation in any way. Governments create markets, all markets. Even the ones that you all call free exist only because there's a legal structure and a, very, and a legal structure that, that is supported by a robust and powerful government. Um, History will, will back that up. If you look at the 19th century's development in England of the market system, it experienced a rise in the amount of government that went in the, the size of government. To bring in laissez-faire, ironically, uh, required more, not less government. And we can talk about why that is. Check, let, take a look at nascent markets in the former Soviet Union, in, in, especially in Eastern Europe. Uh, when those uh, governments went over to a market system, the large reason for their failure was not that they had too much government, but they didn't have enough. They didn't have enough to create basic situation where the market could flourish. So I wouldn't even know what it meant to eliminate government influence. This debate, let's be clear, is not about free markets versus government. It's about what kinds of markets and what kinds of government we want. We want people making decisions about their lives, but all decisions, all economic decisions happen within a context, a context that government creates. And the, the task is to make sure the government creates and promotes freedom. So, what about welfare? Well, I think that government needs to provide a couple of things, I'll say at the outset. I think the government need to provide a, a vibrant safety net, and I'll talk about that in a second. I also think the government, since it's a key part of the welfare state, needs to provide of uh, public dollars for public education. And I can talk about some of the failures of some of the private attempts, the attempts to privatize that later. Um, but I hope we can all agree on moral grounds that um, when we talk about welfare to begin with, let's talk about a type of welfare that I don't really like that the government is doing now. And here we need less government or different government. I think we should agree on, on, on moral grounds that uh, the government is not there to bail out large banks and large financial institutions. Uh, they should not get that welfare. And that's costly welfare, very costly welfare. So what about the other welfare, the one you're concerned with when you read the thing that you thought I'd be talking about, welfare for the poor. And let me divide the poor into two categories here. One are the people who are poor because they just screwed up, let's say. And let's just say on this moral issue that I'm with you, okay? Let's just say that I'm with you and Mitt and Ayn Rand, Ayn Rand, however you pronounce the name, Ayn Rand. <laughs> Screw them, right? They're the takers, they're the leechers. They'll let them starve. Screw them. You correct it, right? You're poor. Get, get your, you know, a little personal responsibility. Let's say I take that position. There's one problem, though. Here's the problem. What happens when they come after us, right? The welfare state is a lot cheaper than the cost keeping the poor incarcerated. And make no mistake about it, these are difficult times. And in these difficult times, we're incarcerating a lot of the poor. There are more African Americans in the corrective system today than there were slaves. If you're an African American without a high school degree, it's more likely that you will be incarcerated than employed. This is a prison state for many people in this country. It's not an effective way to have a vibrant economy. The welfare state has its problems. We can all point to failed programs. But it's a hell of a lot more efficient than getting people on their feet with a criminal justice system. 
Again, the empirical question, what brings about freedom? The welfare state can provide people with the means to get on their feet so they don't come after your property, or prison system that costs more, and we have maybe keep them out until there's a jailbreak. As an historical matter, the welfare state is not a conspiracy, right? Think about um, uh, the fact, if you look at history, if you look at political science, if you look at sociology, um, it's hard to say that uh, the welfare state just kind of grew up as a result of liberal conspiracies. Uh, since its inception in the 1830s, you can put it to the, the Corn Laws of 1832 in England. I don't know where you date the, the birth of the, the, the idea of free market economy. You see nothing but an increase in government. <coughs> It's not a coincidence. That's a historical force that you guys are on the wrong side of. It didn't shrink under Thatcher in England. It didn't shrink under Reagan. It certainly didn't shrink under Bush. These are things that you all have to explain. Why is it that a capital system seems to breed its own desire to check its excesses? I'll give you one quick answer, and that is that Keynes was right. You can tell people that in the short run, they ought to buck up and get themselves out of poverty, but remember that uh, in the long run, we're all dead. So that argument doesn't apply to a lot of people. Now, let me talk the other category of poor, and then I'll hand it over to uh, my friend, uh, who was my friend anyway, we'll see what happens later. <laughs> um, people, let's talk about the people, I, I talk, one group of poor is the people that we can all say they're, they're lazy and they, they need to get a job and uh, responsibility. The other are the people that are born into poverty. Um, if you believe in freedom, then you need to believe in equal opportunity. And, and you need to make sure that people get a fair shake. That's a, a principle, equal opportunity, that a huge percentage of Americans support. So tell me, Andrew, what are you going to say to the baby born of a crack mother in Overtown or South Bronx or East LA? What are you going to say to that person who, when they grow up, or if they're six or eight, wants a food stamp or two? What are you going to say? Good luck? Good luck. Learn some personal responsibility. Seriously, what argument can you give to a baby that a baby should listen to? That's a challenge. So here's my olive branch. Let's join forces together, you and I, you and this whole room, minus a few my supporters out there that will usher me out the back. <laughs> With maybe police protection, sorry, I didn't hire a private firm. <laughs> Here's my olive branch. Let's join together in fighting for liberty, and let's make that fight as intellectually vibrant as we can. And if we're going to do that, let's put aside silly and ultimately unintellectual biases. I'll embrace with you a concern for failed government policies. If you promise to remember that we're trying to maximize freedom, not minimize government. to rant about a whole bunch of things. There were some truths in there that were interspersed with a bunch of various falsehoods. To pry them apart would take uh, a lengthy evening and more beers that I should consume before driving back to where I live. So I'll just focus on a couple of things and then remark on a few of the falsehoods that you speak. So we're talking about the welfare state today. and The welfare state is talking about the state provision of goods and services that are supposed to enhance the well-being of the populace. And these goods, when they're understood as welfare state goods, we're not just talking about the police tracking down a lunatic who blows up a bomb at the end of a marathon. We're talking about the government going beyond that and providing goods that secure, for instance, an economic minimum for everyone, provide services that might be available to all, and some examples are very familiar to us. We can talk about uh, welfare state goods and services that in the United States, for instance, include things such as 
unemployment insurance, uh, health care for the needy, such as Medicaid, minimum wage and working condition legislation, direct payments through Social Security, payments or provisions with items such as food stamps, the Earned Income Tax Credit, AFDC, and speaking broadly, publicly funded education. All of these things are funded by taxes. So I take the question to be, should the state be doing such things, part one, and part two, should these things be around at all? Now, I'll lay my cards out on the table. My view is that the state should be doing none of these things. And my view in short is that the state is not justified in doing these things. And in any case, to the extent that these things are worthwhile activities, private sector institutions can do them much better, much more efficiently, and in a manner that shows much greater respect for the integrity and autonomy of all persons involved. And this matters. The state has grown big in every nation state, and Peter pointed that out. It's big as a measure of the number of people that it employs. It's big as a measure of the percentage of gross national product that it consumes. In the United States, for instance, in 1902 in the United States, federal, state, and local governments spent less than 7% of the gross national product. And a lot of that uh, spending was happening at the local level, about 3.5%, and the federal government was consuming 2.7%. Does anybody want to venture a guess as to the percentage of GMP that is now consumed by federal, state, and local governments? Uh, actually, it's not that big. It's 42%, so it's a lot. Uh, and when you consider the size of our economy, that's quite impressive. So it matters talking about this because a big chunk of government spending goes toward welfare state spending. And we have to ask ourselves, is this appropriate? Uh, now Fred asked us to consider, when we're talking about this, which side has the, the burden of proof in establishing his position. And I have no strong views here because in many ways I think the the pro-liberty side, which despite Peter's claims is not his side, seems to have a rhetorical burden uh, as a way of sort of uh, um, justifying a robust welfare state. And think about why. Why it is that the pro-liberty side, the pro-market side, has a strong burden? People like the stuff that they get from the state. That we got such an immense welfare state is not a complete accident. If it was really that objectionable to people, it wouldn't quite have happened to the extent that it has. Although I'll talk a little bit about sort of pathologies of democracy in a little bit. People want this, they expect it, they insist on their political leaders bringing it to them. So when you poll people, people are just marvelously inconsistent in their political preferences. If you ask them, what should the government be doing, they will consistently be making libertarian noises. And yet they will also consistently be voting for the Robert Byrds of the world who will provide lots of pork to their own home districts or their own home states. People want this sort of thing. So to say that welfare state provisions are unjustified is a pretty big burden because we're basically trying to oppose the status quo. Now on the other hand, you have to consider this much. What is at stake here? I think this is really ultimately what matters. It's the use of coercion. It's the use of state-sanctioned coercion. The state is a bunch of institutions, and one of the things that the state does, I think one of the key things that the state does, is it makes people hand over their money. It makes people hand over their resources, even if they don't want to. And this helps to fund various welfare state institutions. It seems to me that this requires a justification. When you're threatening to hurt somebody, or you actually do hurt somebody, you need to give a good reason to be able to justify that if you're not just a big thug. If you don't want your money to go to Social Security, you can try to refuse, but see how far that's going to get you because the state's going to take it from you. And if you don't want to let them have it, they will, they'll take it from you. They'll bring lots of people with firearms to make sure that they can get it from you. So I think the burden is also on the other side, the anti-market side, to show that it's legitimate to use coercion here. So there are burdens all around. So I'm not gonna really stand on who's got the greater burden of proof in establishing his position. I think on the anti-market side, you have to show why it is that coercion is appropriate. And on the pro-market side, we have to be able to explain why it is that we're inclined to say, you know all those goodies that you get from the state? You really shouldn't be getting that. 
and you need to deal with that. Then there's a 19th century French writer, a fellow named P.J. Proudhon, and he had a vision of government. Some of you may have heard this, but I'm happy to provide it here. Here's Proudhon's vision of government. He said, to be governed is to be watched, inspected, spied upon, directed, law-ridden, regulated, penned up, indoctrinated, preached at, checked, appraised, seized, censured, commanded by beings who have neither title, nor knowledge, nor virtue. To be governed is to have every operation, every transaction, every movement, noted, registered, counted, rated, stamped, measured, numbered, assessed, licensed, refused, authorized, endorsed, admonished, prevented, reformed, redressed, corrected. This is what government does. Peter would have, you, would have you believe that the government is there to provide all sorts of great things in order to satisfy very important needs that we've all got. The government is an institution of brutality. It's an institution of force. It's an, institu it's an institution or a set of institutions that wield coercion. I don't want to deny that sometimes the government can do things that we like having done. I really want to argue that it's not appropriate for the government to be doing such things. And we lose sight of this fact. The government that protects us from the bad guys is also the government that is eager to treat people however the hell they want. And y'all may have seen this when they were discussing what to do with the accused Boston Marathon bomber as to whether or not he should be actually treated as an actual citizen and actually extended constitutional rights. He is a citizen. He's got constitutional rights. So the same sort of group of people who inhabit institutions that wield coercion are the same sort of people that need to be reined in. And we have to think about whether it's appropriate for that set of institutions to be redistributing money on the view that it's going to help people out. My point, ultimately, is that the government is a cluster of institutions that claim the authority to tell us what to do. But because the government isn't always transparent, it isn't as efficient as it could be, and because of a whole bunch of perverse institutional dynamics, all this winds up cultivating dependence in the citizenry, and they do this by buying their votes. But I point out, we are all eager to let them have that power. I happily will take the mortgage deduction when I do my taxes, and I will happily write off my kids, and I will happily send my kids to public schools, and after this event is over, I'm driving home on I-20, which is a publicly provided road. So we're all in on it. So Peter will point out that we do like this stuff, and I have to agree with him here that there's a sort of perverse dynamic when we say we want less government. Government is providing us a lot of good, so we have to be careful when we are warning people that government is the bad guy. They do do things that we like, but I want to point out that it doesn't have to be done this way. It can be done better. Peter's going to point out that many welfare state provisions are going to be interestingly correlated with a whole lot of excellent leading public health indicators, but my point is that we can do much better. We can do better empirically, we can get more of the good stuff that we want, and we can do better morally by doing it in a way that shows greater respect for the citizenry. Housing, food, employment, financial assistance for those who need it, communication, all of these things, they are good things, but I don't think the government needs to do that. It can be done better privately, and we can talk about the sorts of institutions that might arise that can provide them. A couple of thoughts before we'll toss it over to the next round. Uh, Peter was talking about how government regulations do satisfy important information and safety needs, and I grant this much that there are important information and safety needs. The question is whether we need the government to satisfy them. I don't think we should be misled that the government is the only institution to satisfy such needs. I don't think they are uniquely positioned to do this well. There are plenty of private alternatives, and we can actually list them. But to a big extent, when we might say, show me the money, show me how it is that private institutions can do this, to a big extent, we don't know, because the government has crowded out the sort of creative entrepreneurship that might emerge. We don't know what would happen. We have a little bit of an idea, but we don't know exactly what would happen in a fully free market of healthcare. We don't know exactly what a fully free market of education would look like because the government won't let us try. We don't know what a fully free market of first class postal delivery will look like. If you try to do that, you'll be locked up. This body of institutions is using coercion to prevent people from figuring out what will work. And I would like to propose that we unleash private institutions 
private incentives to satisfy these needs that I think we all agree are very important to satisfy. If you're going to answer the question, should the state be doing things, you've got to have actually some criterion by which you're answering that question. On the basis of what is the answer no? Is it because there would be less freedom? Well, that's again an empirical question. He just said that you know that on all these things that, that private interest could do them better, and I'm willing to entertain that idea. I've just never seen the evidence of it. But let's Let's look. We have some experiments with private, say, vouchers. I know most of you are in favor of vouchers as a public education, or a private education program. And uh, we've got, a, we've got a, uh, a, an experiment going on right now. It's been called the boldest experiment in privatizing public education. It's called Louisiana. And Bobby Jindal's educational reform legislation was enacted in April. And under it, uh, students in low-performing schools are eligible to take their share of state funding, about $8,500, and to any accredited public or religious university. And next year, all of the students in Louisiana will be avail eligible for this. Let me give you uh, the one institution where this money, the taxpayer money of Louisiana goes, is called the Eternal Christian Academy. And in this place, students can move at their own pace through Christian workbooks, uh, such as a beginning science text that explains what God made on the six days of creation. They are not exposed to the theory of evolution, and the reason, according to the pastor turned principal of the school, he said, but we try to stay away from all those things that might confuse our children, like evolution. So is this an example of what, are the students of this school freer because they believe in creationism? Um, the, the other point that I just want to quickly address is the notion of public coercion. Public coercion is bad. The state has the, me the monopoly of the means of coercion. And the state's power is awesome. It, not in a good way, necessarily. But libertarians seem to accept a priori the notion that public power is more insidious than private power. And it's true in many instances that public power is problematic. But it's also true that uh, while governments are powerful, Private sector power coerces every bit as readily as, as public sector. I'll give an example. Facebook restricts your freedom of speech far more than the federal or state governments do. That's right. Uh, nudity, hate speech, pornography are all protected under the First Amendment. They are not protected by your Facebook account. Uh, employers can drug test you uh, at will in most states, and government can't do that without a warrant or just cause. Uh, why aren't libertarians in the forefront of the movement to question the amount of information that all private companies now mine for us, about us, on our activities on the internet? There's software that private companies have out there that will look at the websites you visit and make remarkably accurate predictions about your medical condition and your sexual preference and other aspects of your privacy. If you think that the government is the only source of coercion in your lives, think about it. You've been reading again too much of one side. Uh, the government has access to that information too, and that worries me, but it worries me that private firms have access to it. So what's wrong with a little public coercion in favor of your freedom? What's wrong with a public regulation that says that companies cannot cannot mine information about your sexual preference and your medical past. Um, just as private power is a hedge against the public, I think public power can be a hedge against the private. Uh, and I assure you that many African Americans under Jim Crow were very grateful for public power as a hedge against private power in the 1950s and 60s and before. But one quick anecdote. He talked about the Boston bombing. I'm from Boston, so it, it uh, resonated with me. How did we catch this guy? We caught this guy on security cameras. Who owned those cameras? Private individuals. I was commenting to my son the other day that Orwell had it wrong. Orwell thought that government would surveil you. He didn't realize that we would surveil ourselves. Private industry surveils all of you, knows more about you and what you're doing on any given day. Yeah. 
Public power is coercive and it's problematic, but uh, private power is something that we need to think about and public power could be a check against it. Now I know what you're thinking, private power is optional, you can bow out of it. Well that's true in theory, but in practice, the reality for many, many Americans is you cannot leave your jobs. You cannot leave the sidewalks that are videotaped by private industry. Uh, if we're genuinely concerned about liberty, we should be concerned with actual liberty, not theoretical or hypothetical liberty. Last point, Andrew said that, yes, this, this poor uh, Chechen immigrant uh, has rights. Well, who enforces them? Here and just bellow? No. No, stand up. Come with it. Bring it. Yeah! All right. Look. We can talk about the welfare state, or we can start to talk about these more philosophical issues about political power. I'm going to take the latter issue first and then move back to the welfare state, which is supposedly what this is all about. Peter is talking about government power, public power as a hedge against private power. I think we have to be very careful about this because it's very important to draw a distinction between what I would call economic power and political power. These are two very different sorts of phenomena. And in the case of political power, you've got and a set of institutions that claim a monopoly on the use of force in a particular geographic territory that provides its uh, subjects extremely limited exit opportunities. If you don't like what Facebook is doing, don't use it. If you don't like what the United States is doing, it's hard to say don't use it. The exit opportunities are a little different. I don't think that my freedom is restricted in any meaningful sense, but I cannot, without Peter's permission, go into his bedroom and then start belting out some sort of Doris Day song. I can't do that. People would restrict me from doing that. Is that a restriction on my freedom? I would encourage that. <laughs> Even better. <laughs> that people have spheres of control that their rights guarantee them, I do not think is a restriction of freedom. Is there a restriction on your freedom that you do not have the moral right to murder Peter, even if you don't like what he says? Is your freedom constrained? I don't think, I don't think we have the freedom to do certain things. Our freedom is circumscribed by what it is that we are properly entitled to do. And I think this is what is at stake here. So talk of how it is that the public sphere is a way of sort of protecting us against the encroachments of the private sphere. I think is a distraction from how it is that the public sphere is the greater threat because there are no exit opportunities or extremely limited exit opportunities when it comes to the public sphere. It's very difficult for you to opt out of, say, the inability to buy beer on Sunday in certain counties in Georgia if you don't like that in that county. You have to go to another county. In the United States, however, if you don't like Facebook, what are your alternatives, actually? I'm one, I'm one of the three remaining Americans that does not have a Facebook account. I don't know. Oh, here's the other second one. Is there anybody else here? It used to be uh, Friendster, was that the other one? Does that still exist? MySpace. My I drive a Buick with a cassette deck in there, so I'm really 20th century. But there are options that are available to people where they can do alternative things. And I think Peter is mistaken to say that people are not in a position to do their jobs. They can. Okay. Let's, let's go bring it back to the welfare state. Can the market provide the sorts of very important goods, housing, food, employment, financial assistance to the poor, people who need it? And I think the answer is clearly yes. It has done so in each case. You only have to go marching down the aisles of any Kroger to see the fabulous abundance that the market has provided. That is not something the state can provide. The state is the post office without a drive through window. That's the state. Why isn't there a drive through window with the post office? You ever wonder about that? Because they don't give a damn. They don't care. They don't have to care. But when it comes to satisfying consumer needs, the possibilities of innovation are just incredible. They can come up with things that are just outstanding. Think about what we can do now that we couldn't do 30 years ago because of the 
innovations that have been unleashed in the private sphere. And what I want to suggest is that in many areas where we think that the government needs to provide certain goods, we just don't know. We don't know what can be unleashed if the government were to get out of the way. We are talking about people providing opportunities, institutions, goods, services without the assistance of the state. That's what we've got in mind here. So the market here, I think, can do this, resting on a system of private property rights and the rule of law. Peter was suggesting that the government creates markets, and I would disagree strongly. Absolutely. People create markets. How do people create markets? They swap stuff. They price things. They have voluntary transactions among consenting adults. The government gets in the way of that sort of thing. They do it all the time. This is not hard to see. We, do we know what the market in healthcare would look like? Do you think we have a market, a market in healthcare in the United States? No. We do not. I don't know what it would look like. What would, the, what would the market provide? You can see little glimpses of it in the past by looking to examples of fraternal organizations and friendship societies in the 19th century and early 20th century in the United States and England. These were private organizations that were associated with trade guilds or with unions or with certain ethnic communities. They would provide people income assistance, unemployment insurance, and medical care, and everybody had access to this sort of thing. And it was available to people regardless of their income stature. This is the sort of thing that was available back then. Why isn't it around anymore? It's because the government crowded it out, and we no longer have a need for it, since the government was taking such things over. Actually, I'll stop because I have other stuff. I'm going to change the topic, but I'll just, I'll just be quiet and shut up. We're uh, running short on time, so we're just going to shift into the moral aspects of it real quick, then we'll open it up to questions. Um, you guys each give like a couple minutes on whether or not it's moral for the government to provide these kind of um, welfare things, and if so, does the government have a moral responsibility to do, do so? And finally, how can the government do these things without uh, violating the rights of the government? Is there ways to protect that, or is that not possible? So just about five minutes each, then a couple minutes for a bottle, then we'll open it up. Okay. All right. Perfect segue. Is it moral for the government to provide such things? Well, you're asking a philosopher that question, and then I have to start stroking my chin pensively and asking, what do you mean by moral? We have to ask what it means for morality to constrain the government. Governments can do things that private citizens cannot. That's part of what it is to have a state. Now, if you want to question the merits of the state, I'm happy to oblige, and we can chat about that later. Uh, but if we've got a state, it seems as though the government has certain moral powers that private citizens don't. And I'm thinking here of, of good governments. And I take these to be governments that respect individual rights and leave people to live their own lives as they see fit without punching other people in the nose. So when we're talking about providing freedom, I think we should be very clear on what negative freedom is. You don't get more of that. You just have fewer people punching you in the nose. That's all that we want. Just get out of our way and let's see what we can do in the communities that we set up with people that we care about and see what institutions we can create. So let's ask if government is morally responsible for providing the various gigas that we've been asked to discuss. Now it depends on what you take moral responsibility to be. First, let me do some of what philosophers call non-ideal theory. The government provides these things now. People reasonably expect them to be there in the near and far future. And if the government were taken over by Rand Paul and his Tea Party cronies, and they suddenly swallowed the pill to turn them into consistent thinking minimal state libertarians, I don't think it would be appropriate for them to just obliterate all those programs immediately. Peter's going to jump on with this. Because there would be important questions about what's justified in transitioning to a smaller state. So, in one sense, if, say, a woman named Marina, who was a single mother of two, relying on government payments, and she were to be told, starting next week, she's no longer going to be getting AFDC, the earned income tax credit, food stamps, and the local government is not going to be providing for her kids' schools anymore, that doesn't strike me as politically feasible, and I'm not even sure I'm going to defend this as morally appropriate, though, as an aside, I think she'd manage and we'd all pull through. So I'm prepared to admit that because of the network of expectations of our current institutions, it wouldn't be fair for the government to obliterate welfare state supports overnight. I think people would do okay, and again, we don't know what they would do if government would just get out of the way and we could figure it out. 
So we have to be very careful about what we're advocating here. There's also this question about, does government have the right and or obligation to provide these things? If they have the right or obligation to provide them, how can they do this without violating the rights of the government? Well, you gotta sort out what rights people have. I think many rights independently of the government, and among these rights are certain property rights. I know some of us here might think that taxation is legalized theft. We can talk about the merits of that position, I'm not sure. Uh, I sometimes find that view compelling, yet in other times, especially in today's world, there are times where I'm thinking that taxation might be a little bit like HOA dues to fund faceless, obnoxious bureaucrats who want to keep us from doing things that we want to do. So I'm not really sure morality here works given the structure of the government because it's just so perverse. But I'm curious to hear what Peter has to say about this. Let me just take a, a page out of the presidential debates and answer the question by just avoiding it altogether. Whatever the hell I want to talk about. Now let me address the lunatic prince that seems to be sitting over by the window. <laughs> America's Future Foundation for, for doing this, and Fred for providing the beer. It's, it's, it's great. Like to the it. people that have fermented for us. Yes. Um, so Andrew has said uh, a quote that I uh, have got to write down. It's fantastic. Is this your original to you? The state is the post office without the drive through window. I love that. Yeah, you did say that. I'm just wondering, is that original to you? No. Oh, that's it's great. great. It's great. So the idea there is that uh, only the private sector innovates. And I'm wondering, um, do you know where the internet came from? Do you know where uh, personal computing came from? Do you know where most of the drugs that all you uh, white guys over 50 are taking right now to get an erection? Okay. All these things come from the pharmaceutical industry that stole them from publicly financed money that uh, came from our public universities or public grants for private universities. It's economic to say that innovation only happens in the private sector. Good innovation happens in the private sector. I'm going to be reasonable about this. But come on. Come on. Look at history. To answer Fred's question, uh, unlike Mitt Romney or Barack Obama, I will answer the question. The, the morality of providing these things. Let me just repeat what I said before. Part of the system of property involves protecting property. And so uh, part of the system of property involves having a contingency plan. When people are uh, strapped and they try to come out to your property, what are you going to do to protect the property of good American libertarians that want to keep their property? You're going to, you're going to, you're going to, you're, you're going to yeah. Okay, so you're going to provide people with, with M16s that just shoot their sorry asses. But on the other hand, you might want to come up with policies short of incarceration to protect your property better. So the moral ground of providing to some people who don't even deserve it. This is lunatic criticism. So is this what libertarians do? They shout down, they shout down ideas with louder ideas. I've got a friend of life on over here. No. So part of the moral commitment to protecting property is to ensuring that people without don't come after it. So it's prudential wisdom that says that you don't incarcerate them, but you give them some of the public money to ensuring that they don't come after it. So that's why we pay tax dollars to the police force, to the court system, but also to a safety net that will allow these people to get themselves on their feet so they don't come after you. And the second response that I would have is just to repeat what I said before. There are some people that are in positions of poverty not because of mistakes that they made. The majority of homeless in this country are children. Do you libertarians really think that they should learn personal responsibility by living on the street? Yes, we have a moral obligation to that. End of the story. <laughs>
you were asked what it is that we can say to the crack baby and what we're going to be able to do to that kid. For that kid, not to that kid. <laughs> Market, I hope you will join me in saying we should step on the baby and allow it to suffer needlessly, right? Yes, no. No. no! 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 You have to think about what sorts of institutions would arise to prevent the incidence of crack babies, to minimize their occurrence, and even more broadly, we also have to think about what we're going to say to the inner city kid who is never able to learn job skills because the government said, you are not allowed to work for somebody for five bucks an hour sweeping floors and being able to learn responsibility and getting a job and working your way up. The employer wants to hire you for five bucks an hour? Too freaking bad. You're not allowed to do that. You are not allowed to practice hairdressing without a license and be able to acquire a craft and a trade. You have to go through years and years of apprenticeship and get a license in order to be able to do this? Why is that? That's not In many municipalities, you need a cosmetology license to, to just braid hair. Why is that? This is just an example of what the state does. It's an opportunity for people to use coercion in order to get something for themselves. Rent-seeking behavior is what the economists call it. Why is it that some people are going to be able to keep others from entering their market? This is what uh, this is what the minimum wage does. This is what trade union legislation does. This is what licensure does. And this is keeping people from being able to explore opportunities to get themselves careers, get themselves trades, and build up the communities that they otherwise might be able to build. So when we say, what can we tell the, the kid who was born of a crack war? You have to say, what are we telling the people who have been disadvantaged because they've never had the opportunity to learn job skills, to cultivate markets? We don't know who these people are. Bastiat talks about them as being the unseen. This is what we're seeing. We're seeing the crack baby in front of us. What are we not seeing? We're not seeing, we're not seeing the cure for prostate cancer. Most men over the age of 70 have a little bit of prostate cancer. Not going to kill them all. For the most part, you die before something else. You die from something else before prostate cancer takes you out. I don't want to get prostate cancer when I get really old. But now, right now, there's no cure for it. There's no way of preventing it. Why not? I don't know. Could somebody have created it? Could somebody have invented it? We don't know because the government is getting in the way. Peter Wrightman talks about how it is that a lot of medical innovations are being financed by the state. That's true. Why is the state doing that? We're not advocates of that. We're trying to figure out what's the best way of bringing about what it is that people wish to satisfy their needs, and I think private institutions can do that. There is historically lots of examples of this. Anyway, I'm getting sort of hooks, so I'll sit down over here. Why?